So let's proceed now on how do we really digest everything that we saw in the presentations earlier and answer the question, how can we really use technology to reduce stigma? Uh, of course, our two presenters will be joining us in the panel discussion, but I will also be inviting uh, Krita Pon Temvanik for um, the, she is currently the uh, communications and marketing manager and together with the, being the Pribda Tangerine Clinic Manager at the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation based in Bangkok, Thailand. She is leading a creative team that stands between the creative and the scientific worlds of, of how do we you know, translate all of this knowledge to the community. So uh, thank you for joining us. And I think I'll begin the panel discussion um, of sharing the, I guess, the um, experience. Sharing first uh, uh, from Kung, from your experience first, um, in, in your experience with IHRI, on how you, uh, how did you use virtual interventions or technology on really contributing on how to somehow eliminate stigma in, in, our, in promoting or offering healthcare services to the community? Thank you, Danwick. Um, I think there are two levels of our work here. Is um, the first one is like uh, many um, speakers already mentioned is um, client center um, technology that we can use to break the barrier of stigma that prevent them from uh, assessing the the sexual health services. And with that, we provide the telehealth and telemedicine platform um, using HIV cell testing um, to be delivered. At home and um, they can link to PrEP or treatment um, through online platform. And, and that um, has become very, it has generated the data already that it has helped them uh, preventing, not preventing, sorry, um, accessing the service more. One, one third of our clients who receive HIV self-testing online um, never received HIV testing before in their life. Yeah, so I think we bringing new um, clients to, to the service, but that is not to replace the traditional testing, but we think it's an, a good option. Like people need choices, and we, we have talked about this um, before. People need choices, and, and that includes the service delivery choice that they can make decisions by themselves. So that's one example. However, that is to ease the access to the um, uh, sexual health services but it doesn't address the stigma issues in the society because we're still surrounded by um, general population who might not need that services, so they think. <laughs> um, and, and the reason that they don't want to access this service because they care about how people are looking at them or think of them. So I think that should be also a social um, movement or social media campaign that um, brings awareness and empathy in the society to understand, to, to really destigmatize um, sexual health service or sex in general. Like what we did together with um, Love Yourself, um, having Katriona Gray talking about HIV um, related stigma and discrimination, that is also one campaign that I think we can reach to the wider audience, yeah, someone that uh, people actually listen to. And I think, yeah, aside from developing these campaigns, um, it really provides a humanistic approach on how we deliver the messages to the community. And I think that somehow revolves to my next question. As we develop technologies, sometimes the tendency to develop technologies, sometimes they don't sound human. Sound human in such a way that it shares empathy, it shares uh, that aspect that you are understood by your, either your chatbot or either your language model. And I think the challenge now is definitely as developers of these technologies, we can make it human, more human to, to our audience. And I think the question is how do we provide some tips? What do we need to ensure so that these technologies that we offer to the communities understand us and really sound human. Um, anyone from the panel can you know, provide some insights on how could we make our interventions more humanistic for everyone? 
So thank you, Danvik. That's a really interesting question because just now during my presentation, also I've been sharing our participants' quotes that they think it's not humanistic enough, the chatbot. But at the same time, sometimes why we have this stigma is because you're interacting with human. Human can, they have some kind of stigma, especially in terms of like HIV related stuff. So for our chatbot, they don't have this, yeah. But at the same time, that's why just now I emphasized at the end, we wanted to incorporate more empathy in terms of like making it more humanistic. So you can just change the language a bit, make it sound more empathetic. So that will actually make it more comfortable for the um, key populations or anyone that are at risk to access the chatbot. I have a completely different point of view. Do we need to make it more humanistic? Because humans are always judgy. They are the reason why the stigma exists. I mean, not that we are making a blame. Um, society is diverse. Massive part of that diversity is kind of discriminating the small part, which is slightly deviant from the majority. So do we really need to make it human? I feel if you do so, then it will bring the stigma. Uh, so. One of the biggest things I learned as a developer and a physician on the same place that I truly understand and care for it. So that first thing I do is to how to make it without the stigma and judgment. So then of course your intentions are correct in the first place. So it's not the making it more human, but bring the empathy towards it. Bring the understanding, understand the fact that the society is diverse and there are small part of the society much not, not align with the majority of it. So how do we preserve that small part and give that dignity and respect? So I, I think even for us as uh, administrators or people who are sharing SKOLs, we need to figure it out how we actually get it right. And then of course we have to push that into the society and say this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, th this is, um, I always bring the, the uh, food for thought, you know, a um, little bit of opposite side, what if. Um, so this is how I think actually. <clears throat> yes, that's that, that's actually um, exactly the the question that I'm I'm going to 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 dig deeper <clears throat> because because you you mentioned you Dara that um, sexual health AI can be stigmatized. Those who are the developer of the AI can also be stigmatized, but AI itself they don't stigmatize anyone. Um, and, and we are talking how we can like make healthcare providers as a human, not stigmatizing other people. And we know that sometimes we need to wait until that person expires, right? But, but here, we are talking about an AI as a provider. Um, so it's, it's kind of like an opportunity for us to, to build, to train um, the AI to be um, <clears throat> someone that is not uh, stigmatizing other people. Um, so, so how, how, like in terms of like technology uh, investment that we need to have to to train AI to to know about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, to be more empathized because there is evidence already you, you shared yesterday that AI can be more uh, empathetic than than a human being. So, so is is it too difficult to do that? I mean, in terms of like pictures, yes, we can send a lot of pictures, train them with a lot of pictures, diverse pictures. But in terms of like talking, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, having those uh, texts uh, being um, sent out to a person, can, can it be trained that way as well? I mean, um, now I'm going to wear my um, engineering hat. Um, this is easily doable. On the back end, um, which most of you might not know how this happens. So uh, when let's take like uh, ChatGPT, for example. ChatGPT at the back end, there's a um, certain called prompt engineering. So the, the person who's in charge, it'll give you a, a kind of instructions what kind of tone you need to follow. Usually ChatGPT, like a mass product, it'll be say, follow a neutral tone. So those neutral tone, it has been defined at the back end. So AI is just following the instructions of the human. So that's why in this particular scene, if a person who truly understands and care for it, we can give that instructions. Look, 
there are parts of the society might not follow the majority of the society. So there's parts which deviates what that deviation means. We give the facts and then we ask them to have a true neutral approach so that it can actually follow that instructions. This is actually doable. It's just the parties take this in the early stage and it depends. People try to avoid the, avoid the trouble, right? If you put some of these things, they get into trouble like me. I have to fight with governments all the time because there's still a lot of misinformation. So just because they want to get out of that trouble, they choose the easy way. Easy way is to address the majority, which gets a discrimination to the minority, the small part which deviates. That's the stigma in simple terms. So of course, someone must be brave enough to put and say, look, go with the majority, but still these specific things which deviates, you still need to be very, very specific follow these instructions. Simple as that. Does that too technical? No. no. <laughs> it it's really sounds feasible, so it's like, uh, give me hope. <laughs> Anything to add? Yeah. Anything to add? Okay. So we invite the audience members, if you have some questions, we'll entertain uh, one to two questions from the audience. If you want to jump into the conversation um, regarding how can we really use technology to, um, to reduce stigma? But I think um, while they are <laughs> creating their questions, uh, oh, there's one here. Yes. Hi, my name is Nat from Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. So I work with youth, and um, one of the questions that has been running through my mind from the first speaker is, if we are looking after people who are the most vulnerable in society and so more, most likely to be using publicly funded services. And um, uh, Dr. Yudara, you talked about having challenges with engaging with public health and government. Can you tell us a bit more about what challenges you've had? And if some of us in this room want to do that, what should we expect? How should we go in prepared so that we can implement something like this? Thank you. Okay, this is a tough question. So when, when there's a very powerful new technology comes in, usually sexual health is not something people would think as the first thing. Like even for physicians, a lot of people, my colleagues, they jump in for neurology, cardiology, which have a lot of money and fame. But I was deviant from it. I choose sexual health and everybody's like questioning me, are you even a right doctor? There were many news articles talk about me as a tech bro because I'm an engineer too, but they forgot that I'm a doctor also. So. It is a challenge. So because the society is used to that way of following, you know, or oh, you innovate in cardiology, neurology, and then slowly it tickles down to the things which people don't talk. And I always say sexual health is because affecting the, the people who have not much money, a lot of pharma is not interested. That's the reality. And a lot of people don't want me to tell this, but luckily I'm in the outside, I can tell this. So same thing goes to the governments. The behind the doors, there's a lot of um, canvassing happening. So they would look at the things which you want to innovate first. So I think, to me, it's about the, the impact, the amount of work I do and how that converts to impact. So how we can do is, you have to equip yourself about the things first. You have to understand what AI means and what it can do for the community which you are talking about. And the impact, the massive effect you can, you can save one heart attack versus you can actually treat 1,000 STIs which is go underpass with no access. When you show that, people would listen you have to have understanding yourself, you have to get the facts right, the data to back you up, and then you'll be fine. So, but the problem is, again, these technologies are kind of difficult to grasp, and you yourself might not understand. The government themselves is not understand. Regulators have no clue, I tell you. So then it's a bit difficult to get it. Again, it will follow the same usual trajectory, which the pharma put a lot of money to the things, which is like cardiology, neurology, and then those data is shown, and finally, 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 after many years, it will tickle down to sexual health. So I think we can break this. As far as we understand it, we, can, we have enough data. That's why we are here today, right? We can push through. I think that, yeah. yes. Sorry, just to add on something. I think for uh, pushing all this technology through, one most important thing to convince our policymakers and staff is demonstrating cost effectiveness. Yeah, this is always the key word, I would say. So for AI, we have actually proven it to be cost effective because when you reach the population, you help to test them, you prevent them from HIV. It's that prevention is always better than cure. You don't need to treat them for HIV for lifelong. Okay. Okay. We'll entertain, yeah, two questions more. 
Thanks. Oh. Hello, uh, my name is Hue from Hanoi Medical University. Um, so thank you for your presentation. And I'm curious that uh, using the AI for the diagnosis uh, of the uh, symptom of the um, clients, and then let's say if, um, you know, I wonder for the the precise of this and you know for example in the case in Vietnam when the people can very easy to accept and purchase the medicine so the problem for the medicine um, are resistant so how can we deal with that and you know how the AI can support uh, that to reduce the uh, medicine resistance thank you that's a question I love honestly I love to debunk this. Uh, if you look at this way, yeah. so again, I'm, I'm not saying AI is a silver bullet for every single problem. Like what I close my lecture, it's an option which people need to consider now, not 10 years later. And when we consider it as a significant possible option, of course, it opens a lot of doors. Coming back to your question. So this is exactly when the WHO launched the syndromic management. Because the cost versus benefit significantly outweighs the benefits, so the syndromic management is accepted as the best alternative, right? So if you have a discharge, you just whack it with antibiotics, which cover chlamydia, gonorrhea, and everything. So how about the resistance? So when the PrEP first uh, launched, they talk about um, antibiotic resistance. So there's no right or wrong answer. Of course, these are the things we need to put into action and see. But I think if the AI is capable at what we are at the R&D level, that will be significantly better than the syndromic management, which is the ground truth at the population level. Um, I give a talk to WHO recently, um, how to manage um, uh, impox on population levels, cost versus benefit, and they clearly agree. Not only me, um, two universities, Stanford and NYU, um, came and present our work, and cost versus benefit, clearly the benefit is better. Because in Africa, if you look at for impox, there's no even, a, healthcare attendant to go and collect the data. Just people who pay money and go do these things, you know. So again, there's no science, the peer review papers to show. But again, we talked about it yesterday. Is the peer review is the thing to go in the first place, which I don't think so. So it's a good question, um, which we need to work on. But I think we are heading in the right direction because it's significantly better than the ground truth. Last question. Hi, I'm Dr. Tan Yu Wee from Bangkok, Thailand. So um, I would like to get your perspective about context of AI, because when you talk about um, sexual health AI, which related to diagnosis and treatment, so you think about it as a standalone or is a part of linkage with the service delivery? Because I think uh, you also, um, when we try to think about the policy level or the programmatic to put it into the healthcare, about the liability of the app and then how it's linked to the medical care. It can be linked to the telehealth or it can be linked to some places, especially for we working with youth and adolescent. One of the issue is the, the liability of that app and then how if they need to meet with people or healthcare professional how they can link to service and i think you also work in the er and also the app and how do you put this into the healthcare context thank you um, again um, this is a question i really like um, i was about to say i'll give my perspective as a er doctor which i manage the risk all the time and people come from my door, which I have no idea. I have to treat sometimes before I get the blood test or results. I always deal with the risk. We have a system-based approach to manage the risk, not a person-based risk. It's not a one doctor I point and say, hey, you make a mistake. We work as a department. We have policies to manage. Coming back to your question in AI, very simple. It's, again, not a silver bullet. It's a growing technology. You see which part makes sense in your department. Whether it's a current workflow, a new workflow, or like an inbox in Africa, completely new flow we are putting from top to below, we deploy it there. So you decide where it makes sense. Of course, certain parts you need to take the responsibility. Certain parts your program need to take the responsibility. Certain parts, I think it comes to a point that patient itself need to make the responsibility. If you're getting information which is far better in the internet through AI than a doctor, why you why you still have to believe a doctor just because? That's why yesterday the best thing I heard is that one of the panelists said it's okay to replace the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so now we are coming to that. 
I'm a physician, so I'll be the first to be sad if I'm promoting to be replaced the doctors by AI. No, but this is the reality. To me, it makes sense if I treat one million people with technology than me struggling in the department, trying to save one person. Yeah. That's the reality. It's the bigger picture I'm looking at. So yeah. you have one context. Context is the key. You have to figure it out where it makes sense. Okay. Before I invite you here back to the stage, you have questions? So, so I was just going to ask you, I'm not sure any of this technology reduces stigma. I think what you're doing is bypassing stigma. So the person who is stigmatizing says, thank God for that, I don't have to deal with this disease anymore. And the stigma actually grows. So I, I'd like to ask you, what this panel discussion is really about is how can we use this technology to reduce stigma, not to bypass stigma. Anyone from the panel? Is that a challenging question? <laughs> That's a very challenging question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I believe um, so far what we have been sharing is a lot of bypassing stigma, yes, because um, as we have mentioned, the stigma is there and we don't see it reducing. And with technology, we are able to reach people, providing them with stigma-free platforms. And that's currently what we're mainly doing. And in terms of reducing stigma, we always emphasize on like probably um, advocating and also um, promo um, increasing awareness, stuff like that. So probably through the technology part, we can still do, do it the same way. But how effective it will be, I have no answer. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, um, I'll add a little bit here. So again, um, I would love to have my philosophical friend yesterday, <laughs> Alexa. Uh, so I mentioned clearly, I'm giving an alternative to the main discussion. I'm not saying I'm reducing or removing or bypassing. I'm just giving an alternative. Again, same principle. Not everyone in this audience have to agree with me. I'm just giving an option, like what we told about deviation from the normal. Yeah, as far as majority or even minority accept me that there's an option, without humans, the machine might do a job, that's good enough. Uh, of course, we talk about um, reducing the human stigma, but I'm just giving a complete um, different alternative uh, option for people to think about it. That's how I think. I'm not saying what I'm saying is the truth, but the nothing but the truth, and that's the only option. No, we, we talk about many different good options, and I'm just showing there's another option to the table through machines. Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier that there are many ways that you can uh, reduce stigma. And I think you don't need just to choose one method to, to do it alone, but it has to be interpretation of many strategies. So it's, um, it's groundbreaking to have this technology to help with the access to the healthcare services. Meanwhile, we still also have to um, work with people out there in the society, either using a social media, social movement um, campaigns on online platform, which has become a safe space for many people now, um, using uh, role play games, which is something that it could be in the future to understand the journey of people who have HIV and, and their social context and the journey of them uh, and go through that and to, and to, to gain empathy and awareness. Um, there are many other ways that I think it has to be incorporated and do it at the same time and not just um, technology or online platform, but at the same time offline um, has to help us as well, the national um, body also has to help promoting it to be um, you know it to be to reach the wider um, population we have in for our experience we have tried to do this um, campaign on prep among transgender women mainly online uh, sex uh, prep, no, not sex, prep in the city, but we use for women like sex in the city. So that one, um, on, for online strategy, it, it has become very successful. Um, we receive more people um, taking um, prep and also raise awareness and, and make people know more about prep and how to prevent themselves. On the other hand, offline is not as easy. We, we receive um, feedback from the department store in the city center of Bangkok that this is about sex. 
we should not put it on the billboard because people will have more sex. We have many students here. <laughs> students don't have sex? <laughs> yeah, maybe they should go and ask their kids. Um, yeah, but, but, but we don't even say the word sex in there. We just said one prep. And we don't even say HIV. But once they know that um, this is um, transgender women, uh, many like intersectional layers of um, stigma to transgender women, it's about sex, it's about HIV. They were like, oh, not appropriate to put it here. But luckily, we know someone in the board director, so it was up anyway. Yeah, but, but this is something still stigma that we have to work with them offline. Yeah, but, but my hope would be more with the younger generation because I feel like they, they still have um, um, hope to change that perspective, like same-sex marriage that in Thailand that we have just been successfully moved it through social movement. And I'm pretty sure that not all politicians um, really are in 100%, but because of social movement, they are the voters, so they kind of have to, to vote for it anyway, and then we be, become the second country in Asia after Taiwan. So we hope to see the same thing for HIV or any sexual health related stigma. Okay, with, with that, I, I think there's no more time, but thank you so much for uh, joining this panel and giving all of your contributions on how we really eradicate stigma. And it's not an easy question to answer. I think uh, this um, forum for today just testified that since stigma is an intersectional problem, it has to be addressed multi-stakeholders, multi-sectional mm -hmm. as well. Technology can provide that access, that, uh, that accessibility to offer information, um, but there's still many uh, other questions that, that are unanswered. In our first session, we did, we did uh, discussing pleasure for ourselves <laughs> is already a problem. Uh, how do we now discuss it with our clients, with our patients? So I think this, um, it really starts off a conversation, and I hope this forum starts a conversation for all of us on what can we really do in ourselves that can contribute to eradicate stigma in the future. So, Dr. Nte, any words you want um, to add? Yeah, I, I, I just, uh, <laughs> I, I really like your comment, Mark, and, and, and it, it could probably be next year's uh, theme, <laughs> reducing or bypassing um, stigma. stigma. <laughs> you know? So, so, so I, I appreciate uh, all the discussion and thank you all the panelists um, here very much. And um, please now welcome Mark um, to do the closing remarks. <laughs>